getting moved through at a somewhat accelerated pace, <laughs> but not actually skip. is negative numbers and in particular negative numbers as they relate to addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So you can have numbers less than zero. You can take a number line, and previously we've been dealing with positive numbers. So the number line's only gone up, but you can extend the number line to the left and look at negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on. I mean, the traditional way of introducing negative numbers is to think of debt. You know, I owe you something. I owe you five apples. How many apples do I have? Well, there are none in my hand, but it's worse than having no apples, because not only do I have no apples, I owe somebody else five apples. So you can say, well, we have negative five apples. Um, the negative numbers don't hugely, I mean, they don't, we're not going to learn like a bunch of brand new techniques for dealing with negative numbers in terms of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. We just remind ourselves to divide or multiply. When you have negative numbers, well, you ignore the negative sign for a moment. And divide and multiply as normal. Then, if both the numbers you're dividing or multiplying are negative, or if they're both positive, your answer is positive. If only one number is negative, and one is positive, the answer is negative. And this can be a little difficult to explain in terms of sort of 
real world logic. I mean, we've said that the way to think of negative numbers is probably as a debt. That's probably the easiest way to think of it. But the idea that well, you can take one negative debt and another negative debt, or you can take one debt and another debt and you multiply them together and now they're positive. So your two debts have somehow turned into you being owed money. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Probably the easiest way to think of this is something like, Say we have negative two and negative three. When you can think of a negative sign as flipping across the origin. That is to say, here's the origin, here's two, the mirror image of two is negative two. So maybe the easiest way to think of this is in those terms. We start at negative two, reading from left to right, we see another negative sign. So we flip around the origin the positive two, then we see multiplication by three, and two times three is six. So every time you see a negative sign, you flip across the origin. And if you see an even number of negative signs, you're going to wind up on the right. And if you see an odd number of negative signs, you're going to wind up on the left. Let's see. Another way to, a way to think of negative numbers is you can think of it like negative five is negative one times positive five. Um, so that's useful. This way of thinking is useful, for example, if you see negative two plus three. I know we haven't done negative numbers and addition, but bear with me for a second. Well, if, um, we don't have a rule for what happens if we have a negative sign in front of parentheses. And we could get a rule, we could write a rule down, but if we think of that negative sign as a negative one, then suddenly we're distributing. We do have a rule for when there's a number in front of the parentheses. And it tells us that we should multiply the negative one by the two and the negative one times the three and add them together. As for addition and subtract, Negative four plus negative three, or really anything plus negative three. We don't need both those numbers to be negative. Let's just put an A there. And A can be positive or negative. Adding a negative number is the same as subtraction. 
a plus negative three is the same as a minus three. And again, that's the same. Let's do, that's the same whether this A is positive, four plus negative three is the same as four minus three. Negative two plus negative three is negative two minus three which is negative five. So adding a negative is the same as subtracting. And again, this is um, sort of so ingrained in us, we would very rarely write something like seven plus negative two. We would say, well, seven plus negative two is the same as seven minus two. Let's see, sort of the opposite of that. Subtract a negative number is the same as addition. And we think of those negative signs as canceling out and giving a positive sign. That's probably the easiest way to think of it. Because again, if you think of numbers on a number line, and you think of a negative as flipping you across zero. Here's one, here's negative one. And now if we put another negative sign in front of this, Well, that flips you across zero again. So having a minus minus one is the same as having a positive one. And it's not a coincidence that the symbols we use for addition and subtraction are the same as the symbols we use for a positive and a negative number. We think of this minus and this minus as casting and giving us positive four. And having positive four is the same as addition. see. I'm going fast, but but the book and also the notes doesn't really have anything clever here. It really just does present Here's how addition works, here's how subtraction works, etc. Like there are no, no special techniques for subtracting negative numbers that you might not have learned. So because of that, we're going a little fast. Um, when we introduce subtraction to students, we say, well, the number on the left has to be bigger than the number on the right. Because if we have seven apples, we cannot take away 10 apples. 
But now that we have negative numbers, that isn't really true. If we have seven apples and you need 10 apples, I can give you the seven apples I have and I can owe you the three apples tomorrow. So now that we have negative numbers, we no longer have any requirements for subtraction. We can subtract any number from any other number. Fortunately, or unfortunately, I don't know, maybe you like it, but we don't have any special algorithm. Like if we want to write 17 minus 28, we don't line the 17 and the 28 up and then do the subtraction. Instead, We do the subtraction we're used to, the smaller number from the bigger number. And then we make the result negative. So to do 17 minus 28, we subtract in the other order, we subtract 17 from 28, and we get 11, but then we whack a negative symbol on there. And that, in essence, is negative numbers, at least as they relate to addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. And again, we're going a little fast because once again, if I say, so I want you to divide negative seven by, well, bad choice because we haven't introduced fractions yet. If I say I want you to divide negative 12 by three. Yeah. Again, there isn't really any special technique here. We ignore the negative signs. We do the division. And then we either remember or we remind ourselves we've got a negative 12 and a positive 3. So we're in that case, and the result needs to be negative. And we therefore stick the negative sign on. And again, all of arithmetic is like this. To do division, you do the division with the positive numbers and you stick a negative sign on if you need it. To do multiplication, you just work with the positive numbers. You stick a negative sign on if you need it. To do addition, you rewrite it as subtraction. To do subtraction, you do the subtraction as normal. But if you're subtracting a bigger number from a smaller number, you whack a negative sign in front of it. So, 
again, kind of skimming through some sections, but as you know, as those of you who were in Mr. Vogel's class uh, last semester, even with the best will in the world, it can be hard to spend, you know, an entire day on some of this material. And we want to move a little faster through this so we can get to stuff like probability. That's probably new to all of you. Um, we're going to have to slow down a bit, though, when we start getting into stuff like rational numbers and proportional reasoning and percents and stuff like that. That's material that people genuinely find difficult, even at a college level, and we don't want to just do a bad job learning it, so we can then get to other stuff. So, let's present rational enough. So division is kind of special, I guess, in that we can use division to define a whole new class of numbers. Um, so we have zero, we have one, but then we might have some number between zero and one. And I mean, probably the easiest way to think of that, you know, for a little kid might be if you're measuring a liquid, you know, you can have, say, well, here's a cup, the cup can be empty, the cup can be full of water, or the cup can not be full of water, but not be empty, the cup can have some intermediate amount of liquid in it. And the way we introduce, or the way we think of that, at least to begin with, and I should say the way we think of that in real life, is fractions. So a rational number, in one sense, is just division. It's kind of weird to think about. Um, a rational number is gotten when you take one whole number, positive or negative, and you divide it by another whole number, positive or negative. Probably the easiest way to think about this, and the best way to think about this if we're starting out, is to suppose for a moment that we're looking at a division where the top is smaller than the bottom. So two divided by seven. We can think of this as division, but we can also think of this as a number. How do we think of it as a number? Well, the number line can come to our rescue. When we introduce the number line to students, it's okay, we have a line. And here's zero, and here's one, and here's two. And you can see that there's stuff in between zero and one. And a rational number like this will be represented as a point on the number line, as a point between zero and one. At what point? Well, I cursed myself by using seven. Let me try to cut this interval into seven equal 
Well, what P says, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A could be worse. Two over seven says that you go up to the second of those seven pieces. So two divided by seven, just like the integers, it's a number, it's a point on the number line. And in particular, it's that point on the number line. Now, something we should recognize straight off is that there can be more than one way to write the same point on the number line. Now that we've got this idea of a rational number, let's look at one divided by two. So here's zero, here's one. We cut the number line. Let me try to do slightly better than that. We cut the number line into two even pieces. And then this one says, we move one piece and here we are at one divided by two. Contrast that or compare that to two divided by four. Here's zero, here's one. We cut the number line into four even pieces. And because of that two, we travel two of those four pieces to get to two, four. And you see that one over two and two over four represent the same number on the number line. And we're going to get into that. I mean, the next question that might spring to your mind is, okay, how do we know that? I mean, if we were in the wild, and I presented you with some fractions. And I asked you which of these are the same and which are not. How would we approach that? We'll defer that very natural question to give a few kind of basic definitions or I say basic, I don't know if they're basic. The top and the bottom of fractions have fancy names. It really does seem like sometimes mathematicians just make up words to bedevil people. In many ways, we could say the top of a fraction and the bottom of the fraction, and everyone would know what we meant. But instead, we have kind of multi-syllable, kind of technical words. The top is called the numerator. The bottom is called the denominator. So for our purposes, and at least for the moment, 
the top and the bottom of a fraction will be whole integer numbers. There's nothing mathematically stopping us from creating a fraction that looks like that, but we're not going. We'll just look at examples where the numerator and the denominator are integers. Let's advance a bit. We've talked about rational numbers where the top, where the numerator is smaller than the bottom, than the denominator. What if you don't have that? What if the top is bigger than the bottom? Well, if the top is bigger than the bottom, this tells you that this fraction is bigger than one. And probably the easiest way to think of a fraction like this is to write it as a mixed number. What is a mixed number? Well, suppose you're on a number line. Uh, one and two and three and four, and you select a number here. This number is between three and four, so it's a fraction. It's a rational number. When I mean, we we are really not going to worry about irrational numbers much in this class, um, numbers between three and four that aren't fractions. At least for now, we'll assume that any number I put on the board is a fraction, is a rational number. So what is this number? Well, You go three units up the number line. And then you go some fractional distance up the number line to get to that number between three and four. Maybe that fraction is one half. Now, if that doesn't look like one half, maybe this fraction is four tenths, which would let me say two fifths. So to get to that number, we have to go from zero, three units up the number line, and then another two-fifths of a unit up the number line. We can say three and two-fifths. And a number that looks like this is called mixed because it's got a whole number part, it's got a three, and it's got a fraction part, it's got a two-fifths, and they are, well, we have both of them. They're mixed together. So three and two-fifths. This is 
We move away from mixed numbers in math. I, we don't use them a lot in like high school and college, which is a shame because it really is a very nice and very natural way of writing a, a number. I've said that these mixed numbers are the easiest way of thinking about a fraction where the top is bigger than the bottom. But what's the relation shape? Well, if you have a fraction where the top is bigger than the bottom, you can think of this, I mean, it's a number, you can think of it as a fraction, but it also looks just like division. And in fact, you can think of it as division. We are taking five and we are putting it into 27. We do the division as normal, and here we stop. Five does not go into two, and there's no number that we can drop down. So 27 was maybe an unfortunate choice because five appears twice here and here. Oh, well, this two is a remainder. And the way we're used to writing things at this point, or I guess I should say the way the kid learning this material is used to writing it at this point, is when we do the division, we get a five, and then we get the remainder of two. This is very similar to a mixed number. We have a five, and then we have a little something else. We have a little remainder. That's really similar to this, where we have a three, and then we have a little something else. And in fact, to go from this to a mixed number, the two, the remainder, simply goes in front or rather above the divisor. And again, maybe I should do a second example just because here, we have a five and then we have another five. And if you're just reading this in your notes, you might sort of stop and wonder, where's that five down there coming from? Is it coming from this or is it coming from that? Let's do two. into 27. So the two goes into two once. Subtract, bring down. Two goes into seven three times. Subtract. There's nothing to bring down and two doesn't go into one. So that one is a remainder. Twenty seven over two is thirteen and a half. Hopefully, not drawing so many arrows that. 
it becomes unreadable. But that remainder is giving us the top of the fraction. This 13 is giving us that 13 there. And this two is giving us the bottom of the fraction. So to go from a rational number where the top is bigger than the bottom to a mixed number, you have to do division. Very sad because division, long division, uh, can be kind of a hassle. But you have to do the division and you have to figure out what the remainder is and what the quotient is. And then you just stop them into the correct place and you have a mixed number. Any questions so far? Then let me leave you. We're going to pick right back up here um, on Friday. But let me leave you with what the book calls the fundamental law of practice. And I have to say, I've never heard this result referred to as a fundamental law outside of the textbook, but I don't object to the phrase. It's an incredibly important result. And what the book called the fundamental law of fractions is this. Suppose we have any fraction. And then suppose we have any number except it's not allowed to be a zero. Then if we take that fraction and we multiply the top and the bottom by the same number, We aren't changing the fraction. And this so-called fundamental law of fractions is going to so-called, it sounds like I'm being so hostile. Again, it's just not a phrase I've heard before, but it really is fundamental in that it lets us do a lot of stuff. I'm looking ahead slightly. But say you have the fraction two over 10. Well, we might recognize that that simplifies, that two over 10 is the same as one over five. But how can we go from two over 10 to one over five mathematically? Well, mathematically, We're using the fundamental law of fractions. We're multiplying that two by one half, and we're multiplying that ten by one half. And because the fundamental law of fractions says that multiplying the top and the bottom won't change anything, we know that 2 over 10 has to be the same as 1 over 5. 
I mean, similarly, again, looking ahead to what we'll do Friday, but probably most of you for at least are at least basically familiar with the idea of canceling. That if we have something that looks like this, we can just strike those X's out. But what are we actually doing when we cancel? Again, we're using the fundamental law of fractions for multiplying the top and the bottom by one divided by x. So we'll be used when we get to addition of fractions, we'll be using the fundamental law of fractions to find common denominators. So it really is pretty fundamental. 